Hello guys and welcome back to History Revision Success. So today we're going to have a look at how to answer the AQA extract question on the A-level paper. So I'm going to be looking at the Tudor paper and in specific I'm going to be looking at a Mary Queen of Scots set of extracts through which to explain this to you. However, obviously these principles apply to any extracts um, you like to use. Now I'm going to break this down into six key steps and you obviously don't have time in your exam to go through all of these steps methodically one by one. So the idea is it's a very detailed process and it's something that you're going to learn and practice with and get used to. And then by the time of your exam, you'll be able to do this much, much quicker. And many of these steps you might be able to do in your head rather than um, as singular individual steps that you go through and write down one by one. So the idea is this will take some time, but as we practice, we get better and better and the process becomes quicker. So I just wanted to show you the three extracts that I'm going to focus on in depth. Um, I'll move out the way in a second. And then if you want to pause the video and screenshot it or copy out the extracts to help you um, go through this video, you can do so. Okay, and this is the question that we're going to answer. So it says, how convincing are these extracts to a historian judging the extent to which Mary, Queen of Scots, was a threat to Elizabeth? So this means really the most fundamental thing you need to work out here as you read every single extract is fundamentally, does it suggest she is or she isn't a threat? And after that, yes, there's going to be some complexities. Yes, they might suggest um, she's a threat in various different ways, but actually, as long as you can work out for every extract, is she a threat, is she not a threat? That is the first most important thing. Okay, so the first step when you have your extracts in front of you is working out how to read them accurately in the exam. Now, you don't have very long and I watch you do it. Loads of you highlight everything and annotate all around, you know, and some of you even spend 10, 15 minutes trying to annotate and, and list on this extract all of the evidence you have um, just to get it down on paper. Now, I have a much better strategy of how to kind of use your reading time effectively, what you need to highlight and where you should annotate. So as you start to read the extract, what you need to do is everywhere you read something which suggests a new idea, a new point, I want you to highlight it. If you read something which is a good quotation, but for a point you've already highlighted, you don't need to highlight it at this point. When you start writing, you might go back to the extract and then you remember that that little quotation was there, you can take it down. To speed up one of the, the steps we're gonna do later about summarizing the extract, as you highlight it in your reading stage, just highlight where there's a new idea. In terms of annotations, I don't think you need to meet, I don't think you need to make many at this point. Annotate if you have a really key idea. Annotate if you remember a very specific fact that you want to include. Annotate if there's some quite confusing extract, you know, lengthy sentences that at the, at the time of reading, you clarify them, quickly jot down what they mean, but we don't want heaps and heaps of annotations around this extract when you're in your exam. As we practice, as we prepare, yes, we might want to make some additional annotations when we have the time. Okay, so this is the extract I'm going to talk through in depth, and this is extract A, the first extract um, by a man called Bindoff. Now, what I'd like you to do is pause the video and I want you, based on what I've just said in terms of highlight where there is a new idea, think about which parts of this extract you might highlight, okay? And read through it and highlight every time you see a new idea or something new or developed that you need to deal with that the historian has said. Okay, so hopefully you've got some quite similar ideas. Um, and as you see, you can have a look at what I highlighted. So as I read through this extract, these are all the key points that I picked out. New things that I think I thought to myself, I'm going to want to deal with these. I can't just ignore this. These are integral to the argument. They're very, very important. So we've obviously got the idea that she was a sister sovereign in exile who merited war honourable asylum. This idea that maybe she was in need of help. Um, and then the alternative idea that she was a Catholic claimant to the English succession. She was active and she could have been dangerous. Okay, so there's two ideas there. The first part that she was um, somebody who needed help, 
The second part that she was a Catholic claimant to the throne. Now I've gone on to highlight these last elements because I think they're really, really important. The idea of Mary as a magnet, as something which is going to unite the discontented, especially the Catholic discontented. Um, and that, that's already starting to make me think about the evidence I know that might match up here. Okay, so the next thing I need you to do, step two, is to think in a couple of words, as briefly, as succinctly as possible, what does this extract suggest about my question? Now, we addressed the question and we thought about the fact that this is really asking you, is she or is she not a threat? So I need to think and work out what is Bindoff saying about this question? Well, what I think um, he's saying is that she was a threat, she did pose a threat, However, that threat was unintentional, that she didn't actively pose a threat herself. It was just what she represented. So I've summarized that into two phrases, the first being an implicit, unintentional magnet. And the second, just for myself thinking, okay, so she is a threat, but unintentionally. She didn't go out of her way to do this herself. So in the exam, I would write that phrase in big, big letters right next to the extract before I moved on to either read the second one or to start writing. I would have that on my annotations right next to it. Now, step three, what we, we've kind of worked out the overall theme of the argument here, but we need to kind of develop on some of the sub points that Bindoff is making throughout the extract. So what I'd like you to do is to think about each stage of the highlighting that you've highlighted now. We need to go back to it and we need to work out for each one what is the sub point? What is, what is the um, kind of intricate detailed comment that he's making? So imagine it's, it's like an essay, a 25 mark essay, and you have your overall argument, but each paragraph builds on the argument to reach the conclusion. So I want you to essentially work out and imagine this extract was a whole essay. What are his points within it? Okay. Okay, so please ignore um, the annotations for now and just focus really on the green writing at the top. But what I like to do when I go through extracts and think about subpoints is I like to think about each part of the extract, each phrase that I've highlighted that I'm addressing and trying to summarize into a subpoint and put a little number next to it that correlates with my number where I write out my subpoint. So I know exactly where the subpoint is written in the text. Now, what I came up with was the idea that actually Bindoff is saying that Mary was a sister who needed help um, and that she wasn't a threat in herself. And then secondly, that Mary was a Catholic claimant to the throne um, and this made her a threat. Thirdly, that Mary drew together all of the discontented. She was a magnet um, and that as a magnet, she is a considerable threat. And inside the text, if you want to pause the video or have a closer look, um, I've put the little numbers that correlate up to where I think this point is being made. Okay, so the next thing that I want us to crack is now how to put this onto paper. So before you even consider your evidence, before you even worry about where this is headed and whether you agree with it or not, the first thing you have to do in the opening of each paragraph, and there is one paragraph per extract, is address the summary of what the extract is saying. And this is essentially like our mini introduction to the paragraph, or a sentence. Ideally, a sentence would be perfect, okay? And within that sentence, you need to use kind of an introductory phrase, whatever introductory phrase you want, um, and you need to give a quotation to show, you, to show yourself engaging with that um, extract. So as you can see, this is what I've written, and I'm gonna read it out, and then I'm gonna move out the way, and if you wanted to, um, pause the video and take any ideas you can do. So I've written, Bindoff suggests that Mary posed a significant but unintentional threat to the regime. She herself did not threaten Elizabeth. Moreover, she presented a moral problem as she warranted meritable asylum. However, this was entwined with the second and far greater problem she presented. She was a magnet for all the discontented of England. And if I just move out the way, Okay, so once you've introduced your extract in your exam paper, now you need to think about overall, do you disagree or agree with the argument? Now, of course, you can have some nuances within your assessment. You can agree with the overall argument, but think that some or a couple of the points have been over-exaggerated or are slightly misleading. That's absolutely fine. But what we absolutely don't want is, this is right, this is wrong, this is right. 
okay? We want to show that we've understood the fluidity of the argument and that as a whole, there is a sense of whether you agree with it, whether you think it's good, whether you think it's convincing, or actually whether you think it's quite flawed. Now, we're gonna think about our nuances in a minute, but you need to have this overall idea. Once you have your overall idea, um, you can start to think about your evidence. Now, we're not gonna do this if we're in the exam because you just need to go. You need to have these ideas already. You need to think about it in your head and just write in your paper. You don't have time to do this, but we have time. So what I've done is I have annotated onto each of my sub points, the evidence that I can think of that fits, that proves whether what Bindoff is saying is true. And in red, I have um, provided evidence that I believe supports Bindoff's assessment and in orange I have provided evidence that might critique his assessment. So have a, have a look at it. I've thought of the ideas such as the plots and rebellions. So I've gone into detail with the idea of my second subpoint that suggests that she's a Catholic claimant and I've, I've talked about the fact that she was the granddaughter of Margaret Tudor, Henry the, the Eighth sister, so she was technically the next in line to the throne and she's arguably much more legitimate than Elizabeth um, due to Elizabeth's mother's divorce and rumoured adultery and the fact that she's really an unacceptable heir to the Catholic majority in England. Um, I'm thinking with this about the idea of the fact Elizabeth was excommunicated in 1570 and that inference that all good Catholics should therefore remove her. Um, then I kind of move on and I think about my, my point number one, that she was a sister who needed help. And I think about the positive relationship that's very evidenced between the letters between Elizabeth and Mary, the fact they call each other sister, the fact that Elizabeth becomes the godmother of Mary's child, James. Um, that Mary is forced from the throne by the laws of congregation, which would warrant her um, in need of Elizabeth's help. Um, and then I've kind of thought of some nuances there and actually, you know, that that is the case, but there are some complexities to that relationship. And actually um, some of Mary's actions did undermine directly Elizabeth's role. And, and actually maybe perhaps Bindoff is being a little too generous to Mary. Um, just moving on, just to explain all of them. So with the idea that um, Mary was a magnet. I think this is a really, really fantastic idea. And I've supported that with the, with the concept that actually she does become a figurehead for much combined support between domestic and international Catholics. For example, um, Philip of Spain and Henry of Guise, um, who was head of the Catholic League and are later about to, to combine in the Treaty of Joinville. Both support the Throckmorton plot, um, which also has papal support. Um, and then again, I'm thinking about the idea of there being lots of internal domestic plots against Elizabeth. Mary comes to England in 1568. In 1569, we see the Northern Isles Rebellion. In 70, we see the excommunication of Elizabeth. And then from 1571, we see the first of many plots against Elizabeth's life, the Rodolfi plot. So there is clearly a lot of action and reaction from Mary um, within England and even abroad. Now, in orange, I'm, I'm trying to think, you know, has Bindoff kind of over-exaggerated the threat that Mary presents? No plot ever exceeded, um, none was particularly threatening, and actually the domestic threat was not very significant after all. And only, you know, 123 Jesuit priests are actually executed by, by pretty much the end of um, Elizabeth's reign. And actually maybe perhaps the idea of her being a threat has been slightly over-exaggerated here. Okay, so I've also put my evidence into this table, which is another way of doing it. Um, perhaps, you know, if you prefer kind of a more logical presentation of this as you practice your extracts, you could do a table like this. Um, and I've just put it in there to show you how I would go about doing that. And I've listed out my evidence with some of the key kind of arguments I would make in my essay when I started to write. Okay, so finally, we've already written our summary into the kind of the introduction to the extract paragraph, and now we have all of our information. So step six is to write your analysis and your evaluation of this. Now, um, I want you to see those sub points, it's kind of mini points within the paragraph, and try and cover two or three, depending on how much time you have. Now, I think you should always open with um, a fitting sentence starter that suggests immediately to the examiner whether you are supporting or whether you are critiquing the extract. And after that, you need to make sure you include a quotation to yet again show that you are engaging um, with the extract itself. 
After that, it's a case of just providing the best evidence you have and trying to write it up in a sophisticated way um, that is fluid and kind of flows. So I'll just read out for you what I've written and then I'll move out the way in case you wanted to pause it and, and think about what I've written a bit more carefully. So the extract has some validity when it suggests, and I've taken that straight from my supportive phrases list. Mary was a magnet, there's my quotation, for the Catholic cause. She united not only domestic Catholic nobility, but also the international Catholic powers. This was most notably seen in the Throckmorton plot of 1583, which capitalized on the 1570 papal bull of excommunication and attempted to assassinate the queen and replace her with Mary. Whilst, whilst primarily orchestrated by English Catholics, the plot had support from Rome, along with a joint force from King Philip of Spain and Henry of Guise from the Catholic League in France. This not only foreshadowed the Treaty of Joinville, a union between Philip and Henry, the two most powerful Catholic European nations, but also emphasizes Mary's unique ability to become a figurehead or magnet whom Catholics around the world supported. So what you've hopefully noticed is I've tried to pack that with evidence and really try to show the examiner that I deserve an A star. Um, and I've really tried to include there lots of my, my really good factual knowledge, you know, knowledge of the Treaty of Joinville, knowledge of the Papal Bill of Excommunication, knowledge of the Throckmorton plot, knowledge of the Catholic League. Um, I haven't left, you know, things which could have been left a bit more bare, um, you know, just the idea of France and Spain uniting. I've tried to show off that knowledge. And what you would do then is you would just kind of go on to do a second point um, or third, even if you have time, and then you do your second extract and you treat the second extract in exactly the same way. So what I suggest you do now is kind of work through your worksheets, go back to the start and have a go at doing exactly what I've done in this video with the other two extracts that I've given you.